got a new sign and it's yellow sandal. I'll never forget the first time I ever saw a little guy. Uh, yellow sandal. <laughs> then you went up there, it was like, you know, there was a ritual to go up and visit uh, Sheikh Daoud. But that was history. And I was with people in Harlem who had lived with Malcolm X. They were, that was only 10, uh, 12 years after he died. I mean, these are people that went out to where they went and heard the chutzpah. That's what's happening here. So you have to understand where you're from and what you're part of. This is a historical transition that's happening. Islam at that time was an African American phenomenon with a, a certain level of immigrants coming into the scene, but Islam was very much an African American phenomenon in the United States. This is what the Muslims here, the African American Muslims, were right there on the front line, and they were taking it to the street. They were talking about Islam with people, selling incense, and giving that one. That's what was happening in New York. Now, a lot of people have come to America from other places, and one of the great crimes of the immigrant community, and I'm going to say this, one of the great crimes of the immigrant community is failing to recognize the importance of alliance and allegiance with the African American Muslim community. Oh, this, this, this is something that we all have to be aware of. You see, because you can't leave an African American and go back from where you came from. Alright? Right here from the start. In fact, long before many of the white people walked in around, because they came later. We're talking about 500 years, this is when it began. So it's very important for people to recognize that an allegiance to the African American Muslim community is only going to strengthen the Muslim community in the United States of America. There's no other way to strengthen this community. The African American community is also the canary the, in, in, the, in the coal mine of America. If you want to see where America is going, you look at the African American community. They are going to tell you where this country is going. And you can see two clear roads. A road of construction and a road of destruction within the community. Islam will help people make those U-turns on that road of destruction. It will help to reunite the African American community with an incredible tradition of family. Because this is a community that survived the destruction, the institutionalized destruction of the family. And despite that, these families were thriving in this country for a long time, in spite of all the institutionalized attempts to destroy those families. But there are many people today within that community who are suffering from the breakdown of the family. Islam is rooted in family. It can reunite. It can reinvigorate. These people need Islam. These people need Islam. And that is why a strong African American community is a strong American Muslim community, but it's also a strengthening of the overall African American community in this country. A community that is the first to suffer when there's economic hardships in this country. It's the first to suffer. People talk about the depression, go in to some of the inner cities in America and tell them about depression. They've been in depression for decades. It's not something new in that community. And that's why beacons of light and hope by much of the tough rock are what we need to strengthen in this country. These are the beacons of hope in very bleak and desolate places. And it's important for the immigrant community to be aware of that. The first time I heard of Imam Zahad was in Los Angeles. And I know for many people, that in, in, if you're old enough, they're, they're, you, can, you can ask people from a certain generation, where were you when Kennedy was killed? I'm not, I'm not from that generation. I wasn't old enough. But there are people that remember. 
There are people that remember exactly where they were when they first found out about 9 11. But if you think, you can remember where you first heard you hung up. Because you want to God is a voice that's powerful. It's a voice that resonates. It's a voice that speaks the truth. He's been attacked, he's been slandered, he's been maligned, he's been vilified. But despite that, he struggles on. Imam Shabbat, like all of us, is a work in progress. This is a human condition. There are people that want to say that something you said 20 or 30 years ago, you still say today. No, there's something called human evolution. People transform. People become more aware. Especially uh, indefinite and permanent students like Imam Shah. Every time I've ever seen him, like Imam Madison, earlier Dr. Madison said, he's always got his bag of books. He's always got his pen. He's always got his dictionary. He's one of the scholars of the American Muslim community. He's had a lifetime of scholarship. And his community, to me, is one of the most important communities in the United States of America, and helping it is one of the most important things we can do as a community. And our community has to recognize it, and it has to transcend this, this ballroom. It has to transcend this ballroom. It is a disgrace for the overall American Muslim community that the Imam of a masjid that has raised more money for the American Muslim community than any, any other imam in the United States of America. I, I can guarantee you that. If you had a flow chart, you would see how much this man has raised going all over the country to the neglect of his own community to raise money for other communities and it's time that all of our communities pay back. It's time we all pay back. This is, this is a way to go. This is a way to go. You have to pay back. And so it's very important that you deliver this message to other places. We need to support. And institutionally, and you might think I we're going to have a quorum, but I can say we will make that commitment to support within our own institution what we can for this institution here. Now, the Prophet was a community builder. And we are in a time when community is threatened. We've never been in a time like this, really, in human history, as far as I can tell. We have, right now, in this country, a breakdown of community on all the strata of this society. We have children who are texting in their own home. They don't talk to their parents anymore. They're talking to their friends. Online. We've got predators online, preying in the homes. You never have anybody knock at your door and you go and you've never seen them before and you say, I'm a complete stranger, but I'd like to entertain your children for a few hours. Is that alright? And you go, oh, come on in. Yeah, here they are. I'll see you later. But every day, people turn on the television and let complete strangers entertain their children. And if you look at what they're entertaining them with, and then you wonder why we've got little girls walking around with juicy on their bodies. If you want to see the fortification of a culture, the degradation of a civilization, just look around. Look at, at what has happened to us as a species, as a people, because the human project the human project right now is under serious threat. It is under serious threat. We have lawbreakers making the rules. We've got rulers breaking the laws. We've got bankers on Wall Street. We've got gangsters on Main Street. And we've got heads of football teams with charitable organizations that are used as fronts to molest children in showers at those same football stadiums. What's going on in this country? We've got one out of five women being raped in this country right now. This is our own statistics. This is what, what we're being told. What is happening? What's happening to us as a species, as a people? 
What kind of us? We have to ask these questions. What kind of society do we want our children to grow up in? What kind of a culture do we want to be part of? I want to be part of a culture that elevates people, that illuminates people, that gives them language to speak with power, like that beautiful spoken word that we heard earlier. Poets, a culture of meaning. This is what I want to have for my children and my children's children and the people around me. The other day I came into New York from Abu Dhabi on an airplane and I was there and I, and I was waiting for somebody to pick me up and the people were coming out and airports are amazing places, beautiful metaphors for life on earth, the comings and goings, separations and reunification, people smiling with love, people with signs looking forward out of their drawer, wondering who's going to come around the corner. There were two little girls, and, and they were beautiful little girls. They couldn't have been more than five years old. They were Asian American, and they came around the corner, and I saw them immediately, and they saw their grandfather, and their eyes lit up. And they ran, and they just said, Grandpa, and they hugged him, and then a few seconds later, the mother came, looking harried and disheveled. She came, and she gave her father a hug, and I actually told them, I said, you're a lucky man, because they, they just, with so much love, they went up to their grandfather. And then, the, the woman started frantically looking through her purse, and then a woman came up to her, and she said, did you lose this? And she handed her an iPhone, and she said, oh, thank you. She said, I found it in the bathroom, and I saw you leave, so I thought it might be yours. And then she turned to her father, and she said, I lost my ticket at Starbucks and somebody brought them to us. Now I lost my phone and this person brought them to us. Thank God for the good people. And this little five-year-old girl said, hooray for the good people. <laughs> hooray for the good people. I mean, really, that just floored me. This little girl recognizing goodness and saying, hooray. Hooray for the good people. We need good people to wake up because the bad people are, they're, they're out there wreaking havoc on this planet. And the good people are either sitting by silently, shaking their heads, wondering what's going on. Well, they're fast asleep, and there are too many Muslims fast asleep. We have moral corruption. We have bankruptcy in our community. How can we speak the truth when we have some of the worst, most corrupt countries in the world. How can the Muslims call to good, forbid evil? Really, think about that. We need moral capital. We need to look ourselves in the mirror. And, and we, we should look in the mirror to change ourselves, to look at what needs fixing. Because we as a community, we are failing humanity. We were given an extraordinary task, and we are failing humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummah in ugly than that. You were the best community. And that kuntum is in a past tense for a reason. Because it refers specifically to that first community. Kuntum khayra ummah in ugly than that. You were brought forth for all of humanity. Linnad. Taqurunah bin ma'ruf. You enjoy what is right. You forbid what is evil. And you believe in God. Any community that has these three qualities shares in that excellence of that first community. That's what we need to be doing as a community. Let there be amongst you a community that calls to good. That calls to good. They enjoy what is right and they forbid what is evil. And these are the successful ones. ولا تكونوا كالذين تفرقوا واختلفوا من بعد ما جاءهم الذكيات. And don't be, don't be like those, those people 
who went into sex and division and differ after these clear signs had come to them, these will have a painful chastisement. The only way this community can be united without the division is by recognizing the nature of humanity, which is to differ about things. Muslims have always differed. We incorporated difference into our religious ethos. We have different ways of viewing things. Each of our groups has their scholars. There are rightly guided groups, and then there are misguided groups. Unfortunately, there's differences about who those rightly guided groups are and who the misguided groups are. There's where the problem arises. But if you take a broad-based criteria, a broad-based criteria, a generous criteria of our imams, who are well-known in our community throughout history, we can unite as a community. America, the American Muslim community, the Canadian Muslim community, these can be deepened the fight for other places. The fact that the Muslim Council of Scholars in this city is one of the most extraordinary accomplishments in the Muslim world. I'm not talking just about the United States of America. A group of imams from diverse backgrounds, different geographical locations, to come together, to work together. That's what can happen in this country. We have the potential to change the world that we're in. And there's no other reason to be in this world unless you're here to change it for the better. Because there's enough people out there changing it for the worse. And you need to choose your side, choose your battle, but start the struggle. Because the struggle, if you don't go to the struggle, the struggle will come to you. It's the, the nature of life on this planet. If you don't go to the struggle, the struggle will go to you. But this is a long train, and it's been moving for a long time. Both the parties went to jail in this country so that these people could be sitting at this table together. That's right. That's right. Medford took a bullet in the back. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. These people, they are sacrificed their lives for a different America. And there are many positive and good things about America today. It is undeniable some of the achievements that have occurred in our lifetime. And we need to acknowledge that and recognize that. But there are other things that are deeply troubling. And if we don't look those things straight in the eye and deal with them as a community, recognize that we have allies in the greater community. We have good people that are standing by us, that are defending us. We have people on the left like Chris, Chris Hedger, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who's willing to speak the truth for the Muslim community on our behalf. And those people need to be recognized. We have people like Robert George, who's on the right, one of the most significant legal minds in the, in the United States today, teaching at Princeton, defending the Muslim community. We need to recognize who our allies are. And those out there who are attacking this community there are some of them who are simply ignorant. They need to be educated. There are others that are educated, but they have an agenda. You cannot blame the Jewish community, not all of the Jewish community, but a certain segment of the Jewish community in this country does not like the idea of a strong Islam in America. Because the Jewish community has worked very hard to be enfranchised in this country, Many of the Jewish community have a tribal allegiance to Israel, just like many of the people in this hall might have some tribal allegiances to places they came from too. That's human nature. That's human nature. So you have to be aware there are people that are deeply disturbed by the idea of a powerful, vibrant Muslim community that is going to engage the dominant community in new discourses. But there are people within the Jewish community that have stood by our community, defended our community, so it's important for us to distinguish friends from foes. Right? Friends from foes. Recognizing who our friends are, who our enemies are, and unfortunately we have amongst ourselves, amongst the Muslim community, what I would, what I would call frenemies. Right? We've got a lot of those. Shoot us in the foot. 
as a community, unfortunately. God bless you all, God bless you know, Sinai and his community. We owe them our support. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.